Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome conservation biologist Joshua Powell. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. We're going to return from space to the Earth because we've been posed the question of what next for global exploration. And this question could not be more pressing. As we've heard from previous speakers, even conservative estimates of the rate of global biodiversity loss suggest that the extinction rate for vertebrate species is at least 100 times the natural background rate of extinction. When I pose this, the species that probably come to mind are large, charismatic species, animals like the polar bear, um, mountain gorillas, African lion. Indeed, my PhD is on big cats in Northeast Asia. But there's an important question which I would like to introduce to you, which generates significant debate in the conservation community which is whether these species operate as effective flagships for attracting interest in conservation, or whether they serve as effective umbrella species, whereby conserving them helps protect a wide range of other species that they share ecosystems and habitat with. I'm not going to attempt to answer that question. It would be impossible to do so in just 15 minutes. But I'm going to use it as a springboard to suggest what might be needed from explorers. Let's have a look at how this plays out in practice in a real-world conservation context. So this is some field research we did with Rangers Without Borders. It's based on ranger observations in Kyrgyzstan. And this is a word cloud, so the larger an animal is written, the more times it was mentioned by rangers in response to this question. What species do you view as critical to protect? And we see that even these conservation professionals identify large, charismatic mammals as the species that they view as the most critical. So we've got snow leopard, Marco Polo sheep, bear, and ibex. But we then looked at a specific area of rangers' work around anti-poaching and anti-poaching capability. And what we've got here are two different questions. On the left-hand side, you've got perceived poaching. On the right-hand side, over here, you've got reported confiscations. And you see a pretty obvious trend. On the left, you've almost exclusively got animals. On the right, you've almost exclusively got plants. Now, this could lead us to one of two possible conclusions. First is that perceived poaching is accurate which leads to the unfortunate conclusion that ranger patrols in Kyrgyzstan are almost entirely ineffective at intercepting poaching for these species. The alternative solution which I might point you towards is that rangers are consistently overlooking the importance of illegal harvesting of plants, species which might not be as charismatic as their animal counterparts, but many of these species are just as rare. If we move back and, and just look at animals, we see that this has real conservation consequences. And since the Explorers Club was founded in 1904, despite the efforts of thousands of members who have been interested in preventing extinction, over 500 vertebrate species are known to have gone extinct. And if we expand out from the vertebrates, um, we can see that here are some of the wider range of animal species that are, we've known to have lost in this time. And a consistent theme here is that the vast majority of these species can be characterized as poorly known, overlooked species. How do we identify which species might be overlooked and which species might most require additional work? Well, biologists tend to go to the IUCN Red List, which can be useful in, in this situation, particularly in the data-deficient category. But this doesn't always tell the whole story. 
and it can be incredibly time-consuming to go into the individual species entries um, in order to get a wide perspective. So an alternative is the ZSL Edge List, which is cultivated by the Zoological Society of London, where I'm based, and it ranks species against edge criteria. That is species that are evolutionarily distinct, but also globally endangered. It also ranks them against conservation attention and identifies important knowledge gaps. So here we can see the Attenborough's long-beaked echidna scores extremely highly in terms of edge metrics. So it is evolutionarily distinct, and it's extremely endangered. But we can also see conservation attention is very low. This is also a species which is only found in remote and hard-to-access areas of tropical rainforest in New Guinea. And I would make the argument that there is, therefore, a real need for explorers in the 21st century, but explorers to better understand the biodiversity of the world around us, in many cases, before it's too late. Here's just one example, which is from the island of Jamaica. And in an example of hyperdiversity, this fairly small island has 500 endemic species of land snail alone. That's snails that are only found on this island. Most of them extremely uh, poorly documented. We don't even know their global distribution. For the species that we do know, the distributions are incredibly small, which makes it quite plausible that the creation of a single bauxite mine has the potential to lead to species extinction. Very worryingly, there are only five people in the world that I'm aware of who are working on improving our knowledge of these species. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some recent work that we've done. It's just a, a small example that shows how we might help try and address some of these issues. Um, this photograph was taken on a, a bear farm in South Korea with a fellow EC50 member. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, the trade in Asiatic black bear, primarily for bear bile. But this work that we've recently done with ZSL, UCL, and Seoul National University in South Korea shows that it's actually stimulated a legal and sometimes illegal trade in badgers, both native Asian badgers and non-native hog badgers. Now, none of these species are considered to be globally particularly endangered, which possibly suggests why this trade has gone so under the radar. But what I'm going to show in the next couple of slides is why this might have been something of an oversight. So this is a graph of badger farming, which has emerged since 2001 as the primary legal means of supplying this trade. And we see that even though the number of households involved in the trade has substantially declined over that time, it's just 40 households that benefit from the trade in 2020, we've got serious issues with this particular data point. We essentially think that in one province, um, there was a big miscalculation, um, which means that this data point is possibly more likely for the number of badgers, which suggests that between the start and end of this time period, from when it, they were first legally recognized to fairly recently, the most recent data that we have, the number of animals is fairly consistent at about 4,000 traded animals. And we see this out all across the country. So in the uh, bottom set of diagrams, you see the decline in households almost across all provinces, but at the same time, a much more complicated picture in the top, which is the number of badgers. And in some provinces, like Jeju Island here, uh, or in Kyonggi, the number of uh, farmed and traded animals has actually increased. And there's also been a diversification of the products that are traded. So typical usages are traditional medicine, including as a substitution for bear and human consumption. But perhaps more worrying has been the emergence of, of new forms of trade, badger-derived cosmetics, live trade as very unsuitable pets. And the risks and challenges of this trade are almost entirely associated with the overlooked nature of it and the species involved. Indeed, government officials that we spoke to didn't even know that these animals were legally traded, legally farmed in the country. And this is reflected in an almost complete lack of regulation on farms. Prosecutions for illegal badger poaching are almost unheard of. 
And this means that although there are significant concerns about the potential for zoonotic spillover on mustard lid farms, I think we're all aware of the COVID-19 outbreaks on mink farms in both Europe and North America, there's a lack of regulation of practices and a heightened risk of zoonotic spillover on some of these farms. This is also encouraged by, unfortunately, highly unsuitable welfare conditions for what are highly social, territorial mammals. And, of course, stressed animals are known to be able to carry a higher disease load. And finally, the impact on wild badger populations is very poorly understood. While farming was originally intended to relieve pressure on wild badger and bear populations, we're concerned that it may have the opposite effect in the long term and that it can encourage illegal practices and poaching, but also that it's made it extremely difficult to identify detrimental trends in wild populations. And we hope this short study will help improve regulation and policy around badger trade in South Korea specifically. But the point of highlighting this example more broadly is that this was an uh, issue that it was possible to conduct some work on relatively cheaply using a, a small study team and that this would be replicable for a wide range of species around the world fairly easily if we choose to look. I wanted to end on just a little cause for optimism from right here in the Azores. This is the Azores bullfinch. Um, I didn't take the photograph, um, but it's one of the rarest birds in Europe. Um, it's endemic to the Azores. In fact, it's endemic to San Miguel Island. It's only found here. Now, once overlooked by science and conservation and very much on the brink of extinction, in the 1970s, there were just 30 to 40 pairs of this bird, largely due to habitat loss and the spread of invasive species, which we will have seen last night, following a recent surge in interest in the species and dedicated conservation efforts, mainly around native habitat restoration, the outlook for this species has dramatically improved. Now, further work is needed. Um, it's not out of the woods yet, by any extent of the imagination. But this is one of Europe's top conservation success stories. And the main takeaway here is that when a species is no longer overlooked, we can finally begin to help repair the damage that we have done. Thank you very much.